Hi, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another awesome episode of Imagination Nation. I'm here in beautiful Codfish Bay, teeming with life. Nice and foggy morning, however, right now. The tide's rolling in. Why am I here? I'm here because last night at the full moon, we had an incredible horseshoe crab town. Uh, this is the first horseshoe crab town we've done locally here in East Hampton. And it's part of a, um, a, a survey and a study that uh, Cornell is doing uh, with horseshoe crab towns all up and down Long Island, and it's been incredible. Uh, there are significance between horseshoe crabs and medical treatments and cures. They're just breaking the ice on some incredible, incredible medical studies, and the horseshoe crab and its blood is responsible. And we can harvest this blood without harming the animal. But first we need to get a nice count and see how the uh, populations of these species are coming along in some of the more popular areas. The horseshoe crab, or Limulus polyphemus, is actually not a crab at all. It's actually more closely related to spiders, ticks, and scorpions than they are to crabs and lobsters. most incredible about these prehistoric species called the horseshoe crab is because they survived five mass extinctions. Horseshoe crabs have been around for 445 million years. That's 200 million years before the dinosaurs even roamed the earth. Horseshoe crabs can grow up to 24 inches long, 12 inches wide, and have been known to get up to weights of three or four pounds. Along the beautiful eastern shoreline of North America, the horseshoe crabs are found from Maine all the way down south to Mexico. The horseshoe crab has many eyes. Two compound lateral eyes are located on each side of the carapace and are used primarily for finding mates. There are five more eyes on top of the shell that are sensitive to both visible light and some even ultraviolet ranges. There are also two ventral eyes located under the shell near the mouth. The tail also has a series of light sensors or photoreceptors along the top and sides. These keep the brain synchronized with the cycles of light and dark. Horseshoe crabs belong to their own class of arthropods called marostomata, which means legs attached to the mouth. Because the horseshoe crab has no teeth or mandible, they use their legs to crush up food before bringing it to their mouth. They also have a gizzard, and like a bird, the gizzard crushes up the food even more before it continues on to the stomach. The tail, or the telson, is not used for attacking or self-defense. It's used to right itself when it gets turned over accidentally in the waves. Horseshoe crabs can also swim upside down, and sometimes in a lack of momentum, they can end up the tops of their shells. The tails also come in handy to flip them over in those cases as well. It's difficult to pinpoint the lifespan of a horseshoe crab. We do know they can reach 20 years or more. Like all species with an exoskeleton, in order to grow, they must shed or molt their shell. Horseshoe crabs will molt until they reach sexual maturity. 
For males, that's between 9 and 11 years. Females, between 10 and 12. Horseshoe crabs are an important part of our ecology in our coastal communities. Their eggs are major food sources of northward migratory shorebirds and even some fish species. The adult horseshoe crabs are also prey to animals such as sea turtles, alligators, horse conch, and even sharks. The horseshoe crab is also harvested by fishermen to use as bait for whelk and American eel. So what are some of the most important studies in medical research being done that involves the horseshoe crab? Why is it so important to these uh, fields of medical science? Well, here's the answer. Horseshoe crabs are also extremely important to the biomedical industry. Their unique copper-based blue blood contains a substance called limulus amabicite lysate or LAL. It's a one-of-a-kind blood clotting agent. It's used to test the sterility of medical equipment and virtually all injectable drugs. In fact, anyone who's ever had an injection, a vaccination, or surgery all benefited from the horseshoe crab. Hundreds of thousands of horseshoe crabs are bled each year. Up to a third of the horseshoe crab's blood can be removed and still allow the animal to survive. In the world market, a quart of horseshoe crab blood has a price tag of $15,000. Research on the horseshoe crab's compound eyes have also led to a better understanding of human vision. One thing you can always count on in the full moon of May and, and, and June as well is the horseshoe crabs coming up uh, to uh, make along the shorelines. However, their numbers are beginning to decline. They look like club uh, feet. They're not pinchers. This is what determines them to be males. That pincher right there is a grabber. It's like a hook on the end of a boxing mitt. And uh, that's what the male will grab onto the female with and uh, hold on tight with both sides. So both of those pinchers grab onto her shell and it's, it's quite difficult to pull them, pull them off, to be honest with you. Um, we try not to disturb them, but I did it once to see how difficult, and I've got to tell you, it was, it was very difficult. So uh, there's, there's the, uh, the one way you, could, the, the way you can tell if it's a male or a female. Uh, the males will have that uh, 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 clubbed pincher uh, feature, okay? And the females will just have pinchers all the way. All right, so I'm gonna put him back. Thank mm -hmm. you.
place. And as you see, you can barely even see there's a female there, but she's there. She's buried in that, ma that mound, actually. Oh my goodness, this water is so warm. Okay, folks, I'm going to give you a little bit closer um, look at how the tagging process works on the horseshoe crab. Uh, I'm going to use a horseshoe crab that has demise. It's been uh, uh, hollowed out by the birds, and uh, we're going to use this for practice. So let's assume that this is a female, um, and we're going to tag it. So what we want to do is we want to prepare first, because once we puncture a hole, to, to plug it with a tag, um, as soon as we make that hole, uh, the eggs will begin to come out uh, just a little bit. It'll, a few eggs will come out and uh, some blood. Uh, sometimes it'll drip out, other times uh, it'll squirt out um, for a few seconds. So uh, what we want to do is have everything prepared so that we can do it quickly. So what we need to do when we come up when we pull a specimen on shore to be tagged is a couple things. We have a data sheet to keep track of the information. That's most important. That's what we're doing here to begin with. The first thing we want to do is measure the horseshoe crab. So we would tell uh, the recorder, or I would mark it down myself, using a caliper, I would measure at the widest part of the carapace, the, the main shell, the widest part will be the measurement. This one happens to be 25 on the dot. So um, it's 25 centimeters on the dot. So we've made that. Now we're going to quickly, while we have it, we're going to take this, this uh, portable drill, okay, and it has a stopper on. And this rubber stopper will regulate the depth that this drill bit will go into the shell. So you always got to check it because sometimes it'll slip down. But what our objective is, is to pierce the shell on the left side. It really doesn't matter, but we like to all stay uniform. So we, we, it's been instructed to do it on the left side. And you want to make sure that when you, you drill the hole, that when you put the tag in place, okay, it won't drag. It won't drag over the shell. So you want to make sure that it's centered. So if you have to, put the tag up, get kind of an idea of where you want to put it. You're, it's all going to be done on the ground, but I'm holding it up in case you can't see. So, boom, just that simple. And as soon as you do that, blood's going to come out. Um, it's clear blue, a very light shade of blue. Uh, it, and and uh, some eggs will also come out. This is called the cheek, and then immediately we're going to take this tag, stick it in the hole, press it in place, and we're done. Okay? We release the animal back into the water. Let me just show you a little bit about this tag. This tag will have a number on it that will have the data and correspond it to that information on the, on the uh, data form. Um, it also has a reflective strip on it, and that reflective strip will show up quite nicely at night when you're using a flashlight. So when we come back to recount on the June cycle, um, it'll be much easier to identify the ones uh, that have already been tagged, okay? So that's the process of, of tagging the horseshoe crabs. Now let me continue with some more information about our horseshoe crab and the horseshoe crab count. So the walks and the counts were quite simple. In fact, really what we did is we'd meet at the peak of high tide and we'd walk the uh, 800 meter stretch 
um, along the shoreline. We had a bit of a different situation in Napping Harbor. Because of the long, flat shoreline, the high tide literally covers a huge area. So that flat was usually an ideal uh, location for the horseshoe crabs to nest. It didn't mean they had to come so close to the shoreline. In fact, a lot of our counts didn't have a lot of partially submerged or above the water breeding uh, counts. Most of our counts were crabs that were submerged completely underwater. So for that reason, we had to walk more in the water to get a good count uh, up the island. They didn't walk in the water at all. They did the count from the shoreline. So with that being the case, we had to um, walk along terrain that went from the sandy bottom to uh, eel grass uh, to a, 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 at different elevations as well. The elevations would change because you were walking up onto steps of eel grass and then back down to the sandy bottom. Also, it was uh, really interesting to have been surrounded by some wonderful natural sounds that the uh, Nat Pink Harbor uh, pays tribute to each night. And we'd find these a lot as well. And these are the actual molts from some of the, um, uh, the growing specimens out there. So as you can see on this molt, Everything is molted, the entire shell, they're almost translucent. Uh, those are molts. And the, the difference would be uh, a, a, a dead uh, horseshoe crab, which you'll also find plenty of them on the beach um, as they get stranded. Now these animals can live on land for an extended period of time as long as they keep their gills moist. But when they are on land, they're once again vulnerable to uh, terrestrial predators and that would uh, include um, everything from foxes and uh, raccoons and opossums and uh, dogs actually as well so um, once they get flipped over uh, a lot of times even the birds will uh, be a, a big danger to these animals okay we're we're here doing the second phase of our um, horseshoe crab count. Uh, this is the June cycle and it's two days before the new moon. It's Monday, June 11. Uh, we're going to count tonight, tomorrow night. New moon is Wednesday uh, and we'll count two days after and that'll be it for the year. We'll, we'll get all our uh, tallying sheets in. So here's the first night. I'm out here by myself uh, me and Jim are going to switch off. He's going to come tomorrow night. Uh, then we're going to do the new moon together. But already I'm seeing horseshoe crabs. I haven't even uh, gone, oh, I don't know, maybe maybe 100 meters. And already I've counted uh, about a dozen. So uh, nothing with tags yet. And that's what I really am excited about. I want to see if we can find any with the tags from the last time we were here from last month. So, um, we do have 25 tags out here uh, in that pig bay that we did, so I'm, I'm excited. I hope we find one. It'll be worth it. Uh, none will be fine as well. So here I, I see, I'm sitting here talking, um, and I see a pair right here. So I'm going to start counting, and again, you now it's more than the count. Uh, just being out here in that pig bay, at, at high tide on sundown, uh, I mean, what, what more could you possibly ask for? This is, uh, this is uh, uh, paradise. Paradise here, my friends. That's okay. 999. 999. Okay, I'm sorry. 27.4 on the female. I'll take that. I'll take the report. Here's the drill. I'll hand you a tag when you're ready. And 21 even on the mail. 
and you'll see the eggs start to come out. That's fine. I'm going to push this in, mm -hmm. and there she is. So same thing, left cheek high enough that uh, we're not going to go all the way through the shell and he's not going to drag it. Push that flush, and these guys are good to go. Nice. Any questions? <laughs> and those guys are good to go. It was very interesting, very fun, very uh, exciting being out there during the night uh, of the new moon and the full moon with the beautiful sounds of nature all around you, doing a research study for a species that has been around since the, beyond the prehistoric era. What more could you ask for? It was the perfect opportunity um, of, of mixing science and nature um, to benefit the species and I was really proud to be part of it. I want to thank everybody for joining me here at Nampig Bay in the beautiful uh, Lazy Point area of Amagansett. I want to thank you for joining me and letting me talk to you a little bit about the education of horseshoe crabs and the tagging program that's going on. I was really fortunate to be part of this. I want to thank uh, some of my fellow trustee members who also joined in uh, Jimmy Grimes, Susan McGraw Kieber, and John Aldrin, uh, Rick Drew as well. Um, that group, me and Jimmy did the Lazy Point area, while the other members uh, did the Northwest Woods area. We're going to uh, get some great data over the next several years and uh, maybe um, um, keep a good uh, management system going that we can make not only the fishermen happy, but the science end of it happy as well and we can uh, come up with some great results on both ends. Okay, folks, thank you very much. I'll see you next time on another new episode of Imagination Nature. You never know where we're going to end up next, okay? Neither do I, so it's always a good surprise. But wherever it is, I'll see you there.